radio here that can bring the mic if you guys have any questions. Um, thanks again, Tamara. We appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Oh, this is a first. Whoa. Oh, Laura. Laura has <laughs> questions. Like, this is a first. No questions? <laughs> or even, even some statements. Thanks, and thanks everybody. This was, I found myself, my, you can probably hear my brain, just worrying, <laughs> worrying, worrying. And, and I kind of came to this kind of understanding of listening to you all that, that there's bias and there's judgment, and judgment can be wise, right? And I think that's yeah. what you were talking about a little bit about, you know, crossing the street when you feel afraid. Like, that's not necessarily, that can be a wise judgment, but it's where is it coming from? So that connection, I think you all gave some really great examples of when that connection is wrong, but when that connection can be right, um, and then being able to sort those out. So maybe that's my question is, um, you know, what is the thing that you use to, to, to do that? So, so you, you, have a, you have an understanding, and then you have to make this choice about whether it's a bad bias the balance, yeah. that, that leads to your judgment. Like, what is that process? And maybe Ben, you can speak to that because you kind of talked a little bit about that CBT and that idea. Sure. So I, the way I look at it is as to whether or not it's a good bias. Is this something that the other person can help? Mm -hmm. If it's something that they can't help, it's probably not a good bias, right? Give an example. Race. Yeah. Gender. If you're biased against um, any marginalized community, that's not a good judgment or bias, right? At least in my book, it's not. I can only speak for me. Yeah. Can I uh, just, I think that's a really profound, Ben, and I think um, to add to that, what I, what I heard in the question was like, when do you know when your judgment is sound? Mm -hmm. Even if that judgment's maybe based on bias, and I guess probably through experience. And let me tell a quick story. So in college, I worked um, as a security guard at a campground. It was a really interesting job. You were a security guard. Wow, I was great at <laughs> did it. Did you have like a? Did you have something? I did. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> Lots of stories I could tell. But at the security guard, we would sit in the, we would do rounds, but also we'd sit up in this booth, right? And let people in, like big old arm thing would come up and, you know, and they had to be checked in as a guest in order to get in. Unless they came up and asked to just check it out. They would, because we would let people in to check out the campground um, and got, decide if they wanted to stay there, I suppose. <laughs> and usually people checking it out were, people in really nice cars, um, people who uh, were you know, middle-aged folks like I am now, wasn't back then, um, usually white people uh, wanting to come check out the, the um, campground. And we would always raise the arm and say, sure, go ahead and check out the campground. And then one time, there was a car that came up and it was an old, old car. Um, and in the car was like, full of, of young people and they, they were people of color but I don't know if they were black or Hispanic and they said can we check out the um, can we take a look at the campground we're trying to decide if we want to stay here and everything in me wanted to tell them no but I didn't because I, I thought this isn't me I'm not going to judge these folks they're, they're going to, you know, I let in that last car full of old white people. I better let in this, this car full of young um, people of color. And I did. And they tore the place up. Right? And I don't know which bias <laughs> bells were ringing that I should have listened to as the person in charge of security and making sure that doesn't happen. Um, but there's something about that experience that I had as a someone in my 20s um, that probably influenced other things into the future for good or for bad, mm -hmm. right? Um, I wish I would have said no, right, to them. And probably because they were young, they were, you know, we would let them in to kind of decide if they wanted to be able to like buy some property and it was a whole thing. But um, so, 
So I, I guess the answer is just like, there's like experiences in your life where you're like faced with bias and have to make a judgment and you're like, you do it right or you do it wrong and whatever side or whatever. And you sort of build that idea of what's the next best decision in the, in the future. Well, it, and then with some of that, right? Uh, thanks for sharing that story. Some of that too is this, that fear of if I would have told them no, then someone would have found me racist. Well, right? that was yeah. what it was. Right. Like, that's yeah. not who yeah. I was. Like, I was going to make sure that, that, that I was like, no, know I'm white, not that power of white people came yes. in, this other card's coming in. And, yeah. and um, I didn't, nobody was around to judge me, so it was like judging myself, I guess, sure. at the time. But yeah. um, all of that was up in my head, and I think I made the wrong call. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's like some experiences that kind of build over time. I also think that depending on what the stakes are, um, I would I would rather be inclusive than right most times, unless the stakes are so high that you know your life is on the line or something like that. You know, sure. in most cases, I will err on the side of inclusivity, <coughs> the exact same way that you did. You never know how it's going to end up, but most things in life, you never know how it's yeah. going to end up. You know, yeah. the car of white people could have crashed the place. You know, you never know. Yeah. So I, I tend to err on the side of inclusion unless the stakes are so high that I'm going to be cautious no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just let, let me be clear, what, I wouldn't do it again because if I saw a car of people of color, I wouldn't let them into the campground. It was more about, um, this was a, these were young people, they probably weren't trying to camp there they you know they they were definitely like it was just a it was not a good call right uh, at the time and we also didn't have very good like standards around mm -hmm. how we made those like decisions or whatever and so um it was sort of left up to the the person in the booth making the call at the time which is kind of not fair either yeah. So. yeah yeah thanks for sharing that that's a great story any other questions and you might have answered this, so I'll forgive me if you have. But what do you, how do you get past when the judgment, I'm trying to see how to phrase this, um, it keeps being true. Hmm. You know, you're not trying to judge the person, but they keep showing that to you. Ooh, I can write a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how do you deal with that? Well, sometimes <laughs> people are just jerks. That's what I have learned. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes people on the mountaintop have to come down to the valley and go to the people who are in it, right? 
So I think sharing those type of experiences of growth, evolution, um, and just how people are trying to change and giving that grace, right? Um, but also validating the experiences that we have. Um, I've had experiences as well. Um, it's not true to everybody I've met here, right? So, yeah, thanks for asking that. Did anybody else want to add anything? I'll say that I had a similar experience coming back three years ago. So I, um, my parents divorced in 91. I moved to Detroit um, to finish high school, or middle school and high school, and, and then left. You know, I would come back to visit my dad, but in the 90s in the summer, coming back from Detroit especially. So just keep in mind that my house in Detroit was right down the street where the Nation of Islam was founded. So we had a different type of orientation mm -hmm. when coming back here based on the messaging about how we protect community and, sure. and things of that nature. Uh, but also, I had in the back of my mind were the experiences of my older brother, older siblings, going to Bay City. And whether that was for the 4th of July, or to go to, they would go to the bar, they, all, they were always getting in trouble with, by the police mm -hmm. and getting put out clubs and things like that. So coming back, you know, um, three years ago and having to go to Bay City because I needed to go to Bay City. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a tad, it was a tad bit weird for me. Just like, because I remember the last time I was there in what, 97, I ended up like writing the NAACP about Bay City and then my experiences <laughs> there. So it was like now coming back and seeing like, wait, black people actually live here in Bay City? Like, when does that happen? Yeah. You know, we can, there's a restaurant? Like, yeah. and so now like I go to Bay City and I have a different experience than I had, but I am driving extra slow. I'm thinking about some intersections where I've been pulled over before as a teen in Bay City, you know. So someone was just trying to put myself in a new space of, Kevin, I'm different, you know. Yeah. People here are different. People here don't, some people basically don't even remember the 90s. They weren't there, you know, during that time. Some people were. You know, I, my favorite antique shops are there. So I, I meet a lot of people and I'm having a different experience now than I had when I was a teen or even from all the years of like, I'll never come back to Michigan because I was basing it on my 15, when I was 15 years old or in, up to 17 year old um, experiences of being, or at least trying to come back to the area. But I think one thing that is really important is that what you just said is that you gave it an opportunity, right? You revisited that, right? Sometimes we have to go back to mm -hmm. the situation or go back around and just see, give that person, place, thing, yeah. an opportunity to show that maybe there's been some growth. Because we can look at ourselves and say, you know, I've grown. I'm not the same person I was when I was 20. You know, so maybe that person or that place has changed over those 20 years. And then if you go back and you still have those same experiences, then you could just say, you know what I mean, I gave it a chance. But we have to we have to be open to that, that opportunity as long as it's not like detrimentally harm, you know, like giving us harm or like, you know, treating us really bad. So I think that's important. Anybody else want to add anything? Okay, any other questions? And then we'll get over here. I've, I've seen her hand up, but hand up front. I just want to say thank you for doing this. Um, and the two things that I'm going to take away from this are the ideals of grace and healing. I talk about grace a lot um, because even within my siblings, you know, we have like 20 years 
quick to add to that. Yeah. Thank you for giving us space to have these conversations, especially in this largely homogenous community. Um, one of my biggest fears raising my children here is that they aren't going to have the experiences to have the empathy and to understand where other people are coming from. Even when it comes to something as simple as, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to get people involved at the Center for the Arts and volunteer efforts over there. And we had to come to terms with the fact that there, there are, when, when you're asking people from other communities to come into this community, there are barriers that are as simple as transportation. Mm -hmm. There's barriers that are as simple as childcare. And the, the amount of people who, who I talk to in Midland about these things and who go, what do you mean transportation? Because they all own a car. Yes. And yes. they've never had to consider the fact that not everybody owns a car. So yeah. my biggest fear raising kids here is that they're going to continue on that path, and I'm trying very hard to work against that, but having these conversations is so important, and I just really thank you for allowing us to have these conversations openly in our community because it's the only way we're going to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate you all for joining the conversation. So I don't want to talk to myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> you would if you had to. I would. But My husband told me he sees the coffee on. Me. I, you know, and it's really, that's really interesting that you said that because when I first moved here from Cincinnati, um, I was so shocked that there was no public transportation. I mean, I know they had dollar ride, but that's really not what I was accustomed to, right? Yeah. Where you knew a bus was coming every 15 minutes, right? I was a single parent. I had small children. Um, you know, I was the one working in the household. I had to get there, had to, you know, get on a bus to drop my kids off at different daycares at school, right? So I'm getting on the bus, getting off the bus, and I counted on that bus, right, coming every 15 minutes so I knew that I could then get to work on time and be able to um, take care of them, right? And so when I first moved here, that was very interesting that there was no transportation. <laughs> And I said, how do people, you know, make it here? And I remember someone told me when I first moved here that they, there was no poor people here. So I'm like, how does that work? Right. <laughs> how does that work? And I just remember that. And I remember that being one of my first experiences here of thinking like, oh, wow, we have some work to do. And people really think that there aren't people who are in need here. And, um, you know, 